So welcome back. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties. Father Rob, Robin will now address us and I'm now going to lock the meeting. Okay. I'll put got it on this. Um, thank you. And I'm, I'm very sorry for Father Dominic and what's happened, but I'm also quite amused because it means no one will forget this, uh, which is good. I, I suggest, and I'm going to suggest, I will send my text when I've amended it and also I'll record it. So maybe um, when you want to put something up, we can get that translated through the longer text. But I'll try and focus very sharply on what I wanted to say. So first of all, again, thank you those who gave testimonies. And I was very touched by them because they're very personal and it's difficult. Um, what I'm also very aware of and what I'm coming from myself is a, a wider cultural matrix. I'm not only um, English by birth and Northern Catholic by part upbringing, but French Catholic by derivation. I, I was brought up at largely in Northern Catholicism in Yorkshire, but also in the sense of huge French family and spent a lot of time over there. So the French church has been very influential. And of course now with the East, but I have a large Anglican family. So I have that side too. Um, I'm aware that when we talk about rites and rituals and when we talk about Catholicism and people keep muddling phrases. So what I want to give us as a sort of marker is that we need to try and get ourselves to be more precise. Um, we are one right. Each church is defined by a right. So the Melkite church is part of the Byzantine right, along with the Ukrainian Catholics and then the Orthodox and others. There's the Syriac right of other churches. And of course, the Roman Catholic church is the Latin right in which there are different forms. I think that's the easiest way to put it, because if we start talking about new right, old right, we're causing a bit of confusion. I'm, I have no problem with the old Tridentine right. I was brought up in it, although I must admit I'm much easier in a more um, contemporary format. And having soaked myself for several, for nearly 25 years in the Byzantine tradition, I'm also aware that as a Catholic church in communion with other Catholic churches, there are 23 of us, just to remind you all, um, we all express very different nuances of the same faith. It's the same Lord, it's the same one God, it's the Trinity. We love the saints, we love the Theotokos, the mother of God, and our rites express that. But the theologies of them are slightly different, but the theologies don't knock each other out. So the fact that I may have as a Byzantine Catholic a slightly different approach to the Holy Eucharist doesn't mean that that somehow is wrong. It just means I have a different way of expressing it. And I think that's part of the problem we have. And I'm hoping this will open things up for you. What we express is very much ourselves, but it's finite. Um, when faced with the one holy God, and when faced with the mystery of Christ, I go back to the transfiguration, that in the end, like Peter, I might say, I wish to construct my worship and my tradition and do this. But the transfigured Lord will say, ah, there's more to come. And then I'm just dazzled. So in this sense, that, that idea of mystery is a mystery, I would say, that from the East I've got of an encounter with God in Christ who in the end will strip away everything from us and just leave us with ourselves and each other and love. So I'm going to begin by an image and then move into another image. Um, a, a Trappist abbess of Rentham in the United States wrote a very good book. I recommend it to you all. It's um, Tales from a, Tra uh, from a Cobbler's Shop, I think is the title. She was the community cobbler and she found her spirituality looking at what the sisters did with their shoes and how she repaired them. But one Easter, she was looking out of her window in the dawn and she asked herself this question, which is a question I want to start with. In all our worship and everything we do, the one question that we're going to have to answer every single one of us on our own, on that day when we meet the Christ is, did I know you? He's going to ask us, did you meet me? Well, we hope the answer is yes. And she said, how will I recognize him? And her answer was rather beautiful. 
she said, I will suddenly realize that all those I've known and love and met, and she terms it all their dearnesses, their idiosyncrasies, everything that has been important about them, I will suddenly realize that in them, I have met you and you in them, not separated, but connected and all their faces all through my life, I will then realize have been the face of Christ. I think that's what the liturgy is about, helping us and trying to get us through what we're celebrating sacramentally to be the sacrament of Christ ourselves. After all, when you receive communion, it might be for your personal devotion, but it also has that nuance of the mandatum, doesn't it? The institution of the Eucharist, as John says, has two moments. There's the institution which we do for always until the end of time with him by blessing, breaking, sharing, and have communion. But there's also the, we, the washing of the feet, the image of the feet and that command to do that. And that's something that I think we need to take on board. There's a visual element in the liturgy, and there's another element in the liturgy than besides our concern with words and dogma and doctrine. So here we go very quickly, so that I make sure I finish about 20 past, and then you can ask me some questions. I've spent a lot of my life looking at um, liturgical art and architecture, the material culture of the churches, not because it's nice, but because I feel it says something very clearly about our identity as a people. Part of the problem, and I'm going to hand this over to you, is that most of us are very culturally formed. So when I say I like, I'm referring to something that I know, but I may not understand the wider cultural vision of the community of the church, which is why I am happy to say uh, in our context of the United Kingdom, COVID, although it's been a problem, is also an opportunity for newness and change. And Brexit, with all its problems, has had one particular thing that the Catholic Church needs to rejoice in. We now have among us a new epochy of the Syro-Malabar Church, they have come in to replace all those who left the medical profession. So from India, they've come to replace and they brought with them a Catholicism that is ancient and is vibrant and is missional, but is extremely important to know. So I recommend you to uh, just watch the Syro Malabar epic. Its cathedral is the old holy name church in Manchester. They are a rite of the church, which Sebastian Brock says we need to remember, we breathe with East and West is the phrase John Paul, St. John Paul II often used. It was taken from a Melkite uh, patriarch who used it at the Second Vatican Council and then been used by others. But Sebastian Brock, who is a colleague and friend of mine, always says, actually, there are three lungs because we leave out and forget the Syriac tradition, that very interesting tradition of the church partly disappeared, was connected with missionary activity in the early communities going right over to China. And if that style of church, as Dermot McCullough put in his book, uh, The History of Christianity, had survived, our understanding of Christianity would now be very different. As it was, we had tension between Latin Roman Empire and the Greek Empire with the Syrian Aramaic traditions on the side. We need to get back to a, a real view of our history and love it not to replicate, but to understand who we are. Uh, Father Dominic mentioned somebody who comes from recusant Catholicism and explained it very carefully to those on the continent. One of the problems of being a Catholic in this country has always been we're slightly behind continental Catholicism, or we were. So what goes on abroad often comes to us later. However, I think we're in the forefront at the moment of a very rich and vibrant Catholicism, which is all the better for having debates about the traditions we love and don't want to lose, but also has to embrace the different shifts of culture. And we have to say, my expression of Catholicism is richer because there are others. There are others out there. And that as a Byzantine Catholic, I have to say there's a martyrdom in that because the Orthodox always think we're slightly odd. And you get misunderstood by the Latin right who keeps saying, well, why don't you just 
merge with us? The answer is no. Um, there's a definite spirituality, a theology, and vision. Now, in the Latin rite, which I think we're talking a lot about, one of the great issues is I think we need to appreciate the visual element of our liturgies and also what the meanings are of certain things. I don't want to um, have a go at anybody's taste, but I have to say I'm always rather suspicious when people say, I like the church like this and I like the vestments like that, because I have to look at it and say, well, that's only taken from 200 year window. Why aren't you looking at things that have happened before? Or why haven't you looked at the expressions at the same time in another culture? Uh, one of the things that I think some Catholics are rather shocked about when they talk about Latin is to remind them it's not a sacred language. It was a vernacular language, a vulgar language. And the Eastern Catholic churches have never had a sacral language. There might be old church Slavonic or Syriac or Aramaic, but they would say, in the end, what we need to do is our liturgy has to be for those we deal with. So if it changes from Arabic to English, as it has with us, that has to happen. It went from Greek to Arabic to English. The customs of the community will determine some of what we do. And so there's an adaptation and then it becomes part of the tradition. And I think this is something that as Catholics in this country, we need to love. We need to love our tradition, but also begin to love the expression of it in different ways. It's the same right, as I've said at the beginning, but there's different forms. And I don't think that the theology of the extraordinary form is that different from the form of the ordinary. I think what it is, is we are a bit lazy about homing in on one aspect and not on the other. So let me sort of give you three or four little images and I hope that this will help us. And I hope also that um, when I send you my PowerPoint and the rest of it, you might take time to look at it. I want us to be more visually aware of liturgy, but liturgy in the wider sense. The Second Vatican Council reiterated a fundamental theology that the, the liturgy is all about the presence of Christ. What then happens is, a whole group home in onto the presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. Good. But before we can get to that point, we have to say, what's the starting point of the presence of Christ for you and for me? Well, it's our baptism and our confirmation. It's that community, even of those who not being baptized, like the catechumens and others, are seeking for truth and the love of God in the message of the Lord. So we begin with the biggest symbol of all, which is the gathered people or the individual person in faith. It doesn't matter whether I am one type of Catholic and you are another. In the end, the Lord is not going to divide us into these formats and say, special sheep over there, Tridentine sheep here, Byzantine there. He's going to look at the one flock and in the one flock, each single one of us. And I think what we're asked is, how do we find him and help others find him through us in our worship? Some of you have talked about mystery, and that's good. But I will find mystery, perhaps for me as I get older, in relationship, in my relationship with God. How do I express it? By somehow letting the symbols and structures of my church speak to me. So, for instance... In the tradition I now represent, we have icon screens. A lot of people say, oh, that's just like the rude screens. They aren't. The icon screen is very definitely a theological interpretation of the communion of saints, because the icons are perceptions or doors to the kingdom. What they represent are also the realities that are with us. A rude screen isn't. And that's where I would say Catholics have to look at the nuances. So a statue is not an icon is one thing I'd say. The other thing is we like looking at our altars and, and we have a sort of plethora of Victorian Gothic in Catholicism in Great Britain. But there are other traditions 
And when we look at the beginnings of the Christian community, the Christian church, what did they do? Well, they took over the basilica, but they made a very clear distinction that within that basilica, the Christian tradition was represented by several focal points, the altar, the holy table. We call it the holy table, others call it the altar. But if you look at the consecration rite of the church, the central points are the consecration of that altar. When you close a church building down, you remove it, or you take it away, or you take the relics out. It's not about the tabernacle, the central gathering where we get the reserve sacrament from is that altar which represents Christ's tomb, his sacrifice, but it's a symbol of his abiding presence. So I would say, let's look at what the altar means. Um, it should be self-standing because it has to be itself. Whether we face east or west, that's another debate. But the altar should be a visible symbol as soon as we go into the church of something that pulls us, the sacrament of the Eucharist. But we also have the font. The baptistry was always a part of the building, even though separate, because there those who were catechized first received the mysteries. And they really went through a visual element of plunging into death in the waters to be pulled up. And as they were pulled up, most of the Basilican baptistries, that was where the art first began. You had this catechetical art above them, glimmering with the lights, where for the first time, perhaps the words they'd been taught suddenly made a little more sense. And the creed they professed they saw evoked around them. And it's then that they were anointed and clothed and taken into the great assembly of the Eucharist, where for the very first time, they then received the sacrament of sacraments, the Eucharist, the Lord himself, but were also allowed to pray. So there's the baptistry. The proclamation of the word, I think in all our renewal, we really need to give thanks for that. And I heard one or two of the testimony is there, that the scriptures have been revealed back to us in a way that perhaps have been forgotten. For me, um, one of the things that we're trying to work on is um, we only have the Old Testament during parts of Lent, and that's not good. So there's a move, first of all, in the divine liturgy of the Eucharist to try and get a kind of revised lectionary. But secondly, in the other rites, and this is where I'm also going to say the other rites which make up our prayer, our divine office, our daily hours, and the rites that we have for farewell, funerals, marriage, whatever like, happened like that, in there the scripture itself needs to be connected to what is going on. So it makes that rich sense. Because having been baptised, we have to learn. And we learn by hearing the word. But we also have to see that the word is important. That's why the gospel book held in such great esteem in the East is seen as a sacramental connection. It's Christ actually there. And when you carry the gospel book in procession, the people bow or touch it or make the sign of the cross. Not because it's like the Holy Quran, textually the word of God in that real sense that they understand. It's more that here is Christ who from this word is proclaiming. And visually we see the importance in that book of what we believe about the scriptures, about the gospel particularly. And where the gospel is placed and enthroned should be understood as one of our sacred spots in our building. So I would also say, have a little look at the Syrian tradition because they have a bema in the middle of their churches and always have, where the liturgy of the word takes place on a platform with the people surrounding it. I'm throwing out a few things, but I just want to end because I, I'm hoping we'll have these five minutes to say something back to you. I'm always under the impression that we need to go back to our origins. And I think the book of Acts tells us what the early Christians did. And so I suggest that if you want to um, really go back to looking at Acts 2, 42 to 47, just to see those little building blocks of Christian life in which there is teaching, fraternity, 
the breaking of the bread, which is understood, I think, as Eucharist, and the prayers, those other offices we have. But then there's that distribution of common, there's meals together, and there's that regular attendance together of worship in temple and home. We can build on that. But I would say what we need to do is look again at the visual elements of our church and our buildings and what we have and see how they speak to us and what they mean. Because the liturgy is more than just text. It's about the hidden symbol, the symbol that's mediating the presence of God. I'll end there, and I'm just going to end there with a quote from Saint Antoine d'Exupéry. It's from The Little Fox, um, and I want to twist it. I want to say the word, um, tame means our spiritual journey in our worship so this take this away and translate the word tame as your own understanding or new look into liturgy we have forgotten this truth said the fox but you must not forget it you become responsible forever for what you have tamed and we are responsible because we are the ones who celebrate the liturgy. And it's up to us to make it as understandable, but also to open its treasures in its different ways to others without canonizing one section and making another look silly. Um, I'm all for plurality, but I believe that our right, and the right in the Latin church is one with a number of variations which you can find also historically. So I'll finish there. Father Robin, thank you very much indeed. And I think that we are very, I mean, we are in need of broadening, that's what I hoped would happen today in the conference, we're broadening our resources, broadening our perspectives. Um, I think we've already got a question coming in, so that's great. Those are always the best talks that raise the questions. From Cosmo, who asks two issues. First, he says that he thinks that a sacral language is a language that the faithful deem sacral, um, which they might deem such as Latin or Greek or, or, or so on. Um, and he says all languages except Esperanto derive from the vernacular. Secondly, um, he says, you didn't address the question of identity. So I wondered if you have anything to say about the faithful deeming a language sacred and anything maybe about uh, identity. Um, I, I'm not sure I agree with that first point because I have to say that from the tradition of our Melkite Catholics, we use four languages in the liturgy each Sunday. So we have Greek, we have Arabic, we sometimes have French and we have English. I think a sacral language is a language that allows us to touch God and God to touch us. Mm. Uh, we're not, we don't, we, we're not like Judaism where we have Hebrew. We're not like um, Islam where Arabic is definitely connected with words of God. In fact, the Cluniac monks used to say the, the word and speech of God is actually music and silence, but I'm not going to go down that. But I understand what you mean, but I don't think faithful always deem something sacral i think we need to get our poets into this because mm -hmm. language and the english language has a beautiful sacrality but it's the way that it conveys it's how the language conveys things so i think i understand what you mean but i would say vernacular is vernacular vernacular is the way we in integrate the language of worship should have that beauty which conveys is a vehicle so i'd leave i think that's i hope that's all right as an answer second one about identity not quite sure what that means. Um, identity comes very much from how we, I suppose, worship together. But I can have a community of people worshipping who don't have the same identity because they're not in communion in their hearts. So I think identity in, in, I would say, theological terms comes through our understanding of the Christ and our understanding of the Lord. My identity as Byzantine Catholic is because that's where now I minister, pray, work, um, and actually connect with people. A lot of it is just soaking oneself into it. 
I think the Catholic identity has to take the word Catholic seriously. It's a universal identity. The church Catholic is a church that is not bound by one thing, by one right, by one tradition. It has a plurality which has been given it to, to enrich it. And I suppose identity, your identity, my identity as English Catholic is not the same as it was 20 years ago. Um, we're in a cultural change. So sociologically, I think this needs to be answered. And I, I'm not a sociologist. Um, so maybe one might spend time and have another session, another, another sort of whole um, seminar on identity. What does it mean to be Catholic? Anyway, I hope that's answered a little bit. Thank you, Father Robin. If anybody else has a question, maybe if you'd either like to put it in the chat or are you going to put it into gallery view, just raise your, do the hand raise thing. Mary Stella. Uh, you're muted, Mary Stella, because you're in the, you're still in the translation place, I think. Mary Stella? Mm? Okay. Well, someone, so, Raphael uh, said. Raphael. Yeah. Raphael, yeah. you're still in the, in the, can you come out of the translation? Oh, she's going to, Mary Stella's going to put it in chat. Maybe Raphael, if you put it in the chat, I think we're having difficulty hearing you because of the translation. Sorry, does anybody else, while they're typing their questions, does anybody else, we'll go keep continuing till about 11.40. That's okay, quite happy with that. France, so, and then we can have 20 minutes for coffee. Okay, so, um, I have, and so Mary Stella's got a comment about identity. Can we hear you now, Mary Stella? No, because you're still in the translation, I think. If you can come out of that. Ah, uh, okay, just a moment. Ah, uh, okay, I'll read it out. Sorry about this. Um, yeah. Sorry, somebody said Vatican II says that we truly meet Christ in various ways. We meet him just as truly in the word as in the sacraments. Would it not help if we commissioned readers, if we commissioned readers as we do Eucharistic ministers? Um, I would say, an unequivocal yes, simply because the proclamation of scripture has always been seen as a very important ministry. And I would say that if you look across the traditions, and I'm not going into gender ministry, um, you will find that the, the role of the reader has been very important. And in fact, in the Byzantine tradition, they are definitely important, particularly because one cannot replicate another ministry. So I, as priest, can't do what the reader does, nor can I do what the deacon does, um, which is a slightly different thing from the way things perhaps developed in later medieval Latin Christianity. Um, but I would say yes, and I would say yes, because we need to train people to proclaim the scriptures, to understand them. Um, the way you proclaim it conveys quite a lot of meaning. And I've heard some extraordinary conveyances in my time uh, from people who have not read very well. But on the other hand, I'd say that a lot of people are really now taking more care than they did. But yes, I would agree. I would agree that. Is that helpful? And then there's another one I've seen. Um, every Father, Liam. Father Liam next. I think a couple of people are typing questions. So Father Liam, in the meantime. It's just a simple echo. It's interesting. And I think last year, Francis um, uh, is, is trying to extend the ministry of lector and acolyte. Um, so um, amongst the lay faithful as a ministry that might be exercised. So it just speaks to what Robin has said and what Janet has said, I think, about actually instituting people formally in, in a ministry of, of as, as lector. Um, which which obviously will uh, give more authority, I guess, and validation to people proclaiming the word within the assembly. So there's something there that's happened and it might be needed of more um, to investigate that further, really. So how it takes um, expression in the local church. Yes, but there's, there's um... oh, someone wants a seminar on identity. So there you are. I've thrown that up there. Um, but there's someone has said, can I read it out? It's it's Marister, is it? Yes. Catholic, yes, identity, 
Catholic identity. I was brought up in many cultures. I'm a Latin American Catholic, but was very influenced by Spanish Navarro and Catholicism. I traveled through many countries after living in Spain. And while in the US, I was part of the Byzantine community because I found I prayed better. Having been to Byzantine Tridentine and New Mass, I felt at home in all, because in all I shared faith in God and that identity as Catholic was more important than all my cultural background. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think I find that myself. Um, theologically, I have a particular nuance, but I think when it comes to worship, worship's not necessarily about doctrinal theology. It's about the interaction of the one Lord or God with us. And if we find that, then that is the right thing we're doing. So I would, I would understand that. And then there's another one, Cosmo again. Oh, he just want, he was happy to have a seminar on identity. Um, the six decades of assaults on traditional identity fostered by Vatican II. I'm a linguistic scientist, and I'm afraid I don't buy your argument on sacral language. Well, that's linguistic, and I'm actually a liturgical theologian and also an artist, so I think a poet. So I'm coming from one angle and you're another, and I think a seminar on identity would bring these things together. And um, I'm not speaking off my own hat about sacral language. I think I'm speaking for a large number who actually mm. uh, agree. And I think we understand it. The poetic understanding is key to part of this. Um, but I think you have to involve yourself in a community where there are more than one language at use. And then you begin to understand what sacrality of language might mean mm. in a nuanced way. So sorry, it's not a, not a negative comment. It's just I welcome that, but I I'm not agreeing that I um, understand. I'm not agreeing with the, with the nuance there. If I could just come in there, I mean, I think that's actually a very interesting point. I think um, Dr. Mida Volk is going to speak later on the question of understanding the liturgy. I'm really interested to hear what you're going to say about that, Mida, because. Some, I mean, John Milbank says that actually liturgical and theological language shouldn't be easy to understand, because if we think we've understood God, then we haven't understood God. No, we never do. But on the other hand, I mean, we mustn't create a sort of, as Louis-Marie Chauvet says, a kind of phantasmagoria, whereby everything is so mysterious that I can just project onto it and let my imagination run riot. So, I mean, people have said that the Anglican translation of the, in the 16th century was not the ordinary English of the time. It was meant to be an elevated poetic English. And I would hope that when we do produce liturgical books, we might, I think somebody mentioned earlier about poets. I mean, we have Catholic poets in England or in the English language like Michael Simmons Roberts, and Les Murray and so on. I mean, let's ask these people what might happen. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, anybody else got any questions for or comments for Canon Robin? Uh, oh, I see another question coming in. Ah. Mm. Something about uh, Raphael is talking about chastising Latin people to preserve their liturgical culture. Um, good to other rites. We also have to accept some cultural barriers are not bad. Baptized milk I've brought up in Roman right. Very interesting canonically. Uh, <laughs> Because I was never taught Arabic, I cannot say Melkite right. Well, that's actually, I'm surprised at that because many Melkite churches uh, use different language structures. Um, so I'd say, have a look. Same with Latin right. I don't always feel fully culturally tuned to the cultural approach of the right, but I will not blame either right for preserving their cultural exclusivism. If it'd be nice if someone could celebrate their own. I think I think we are a lot of it is actually simply happenstance. So I would say keep a wider, keep a wider look at what's going on. And then Roberta says, I was received into the church in 1962, so experienced and loved the Latin rite, but I think many valued it then because it made it different. I'm grateful to the vernacular mass for what has been a richer experience of the presence of Christ in community and the word as well as the Holy Eucharist. Um, can I leave you all with a comment? Um, I mentioned I was partly French. Uh, I preferred when I was in England, and I have to confess this, going with my Anglican grandmother to the sung Eucharist than going to the eight o'clock Latin mass, which I found rather boring as a child and preferred the music. So it's music. In France, 
we had a cure whose Latin was execrable. Um, and I don't think I ever understood what he was saying. The Indominus Viscum was something like that. So a lot of it will depend on nuance. Um, I understand the beauty of Latin. I personally am happy with a different divergence. Anyway, I'll leave it there and thank you for the questions. And I hope I can send my stuff and I hope we have some more seminars, especially mm -hmm. on identity and things like that. Well, Karen Robbins, thank you very much. And we wish you also bon voyage because uh, you're traveling. I'm thank traveling you. To see an old aunt, 94. Oh, well, God bless her. And thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>